Hi, and welcome to the Making Medicare Data More Accessible Through Common Data Models and FHIR APIs webinar series. Before we begin, I'd like to provide a brief overview of this project, which addresses the federal priority to expand data capacity or data infrastructure for conducting patient-centered outcomes research, abbreviated as PCOR, that informs decisions about the effectiveness of health interventions used in the Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance programs. The Transformed Medicaid Statistical Information System, also known as TMSIS, has analytic files that are suitable for research, known as TAF RIFs, as part of a new research optimized national Medicaid dataset that begins in 2014, with full representation from all jurisdictions in 2016. These files include data on Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program enrollment, demographics, service utilization, and payments. This project created open source code to format these data into the FDA Sentinel and the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership Common Data Models to improve access, accelerate analyses, and to enable multi-database studies. The aim of this webinar series is to educate researchers who are using or plan to use Medicaid data about the new data transformation tools and to disseminate major findings. So each video in this webinar series is a chapter which covers a key objective. So my name is Elizabeth Suarez and I'm from Rutgers University from the School of Public Health and I will be leading chapter six, which specifically is about prenatal and congenital syphilis in the US, characterized screening and treatment. So please note that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official positions of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the Food and Drug Administration. The work discussed in this presentation was funded by the Office of the Secretary Patient Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund, which was made available to FDA by the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation through an interagency agreement. The US FDA funded the Sentinel Initiative contract. Okay, so now we can get into our main topic today. So our task for this project was to conduct a demonstration study using the TAF dataset and the Sentinel analytic tools on a topic that is important to maternal health. So we chose to focus on congenital syphilis, specifically on syphilis screening and treatment during pregnancy, given the ongoing, ongoing rise in congenital syphilis in the US. Using the new TMSS data and the existing Sentinel data partners, we can compare screening and treatment between publicly and commercially insured people in the US. So this figure here was taken from a morbidity and mortality weekly report from the CDC published in 2023. It demonstrates the steep rise in primary and secondary syphilis among reproductive age females since 2012, which is demonstrated in the blue line. And then the corresponding rise in congenital syphilis cases in newborns, which demonstrated here by the blue bars. So despite this, we have proven strategies for prevention of congenital syphilis through timely and adequate screening, screening and treatment in pregnancy. So in this analysis of congenital syphilis cases, the authors identified um, missed prevention opportunities. So in these cases, only 50% 58% had timely screening in pregnancy, and only 12% of those cases with timely screening had adequate treatment, which was just 7% overall of the cohort. Um, adequate treatment involves taking the correct antibiotic, which is benzathine penicillin G, and uh, taking it at the correct dose and timing for the syphilis stage, and making sure that it's taken at least 30 days prior to delivery. So overall, this analysis found that at least 93% of these congenital syphilis cases had identifiable missed prevention opportunities. So there is some previous research on how screening is less than universal in the US. So this study here was of Medicaid enrollees in six southern states, and they found that first trimester screening ranged from about 63% to 95%. Um, and they did not find any improvement over time. Um, despite this known and documented increase in congenital syphilis cases. So this brings us to our, the objective of this study. We wanted to get a broader picture of screening and treatment in syphilis in pregnancy in the US. And so our first question was, which proportion 
what proportion of pregnant individuals are screened for syphilis in pregnancy. Then we wanted to look at among those who were diagnosed with syphilis, how are they treated in pregnancy and when? And then finally, we wanted to look at the infants and find out um, if they were tested in treatment in the first day, days of life, specifically those infants who are born to pregnant individuals with a syphilis diagnosis in pregnancy. Okay, so let's get into the methods. So this study included Medicaid data, which as I mentioned at the top was the Tiamesis files, which were transformed into the Sentinel common data model. And also for the purpose of this study, we included the mother infant linkage of uh, delivery records to infant files. The data spanned 2014 to 2021, and we did exclude some states that didn't meet our minimum standards for data quality and completeness. We also included three national commercial Sentinel data partners that also populate the mother infant linkage table so that we could compare to our Medicaid population. And this data spanned from 2010 to 2023. So as a primary requirement for insurance enrollment, we had a base population um, where we required that every pregnant person was enrolled from at least the estimated last menstrual period date. So that's the approximate start of pregnancy through one week after the delivery date. So this ensures that we will observe all of the care that they received during pregnancy. However, acknowledging um, that many pregnancies only become eligible for Medicaid coverage because they are pregnant, we also have individuals who are enrolling during pregnancy. So we created these two additional populations that enroll in either first trimester or second trimester. So we can look at screening and treat screening specifically in these populations as well. And then our key analysis variables, uh, we defined syphilis screening using procedure codes that were specifically for screening tests for syphilis and also obstetric panels that include a syphilis test. For syphilis diagnoses, unfortunately, we do not have data on the results of the screening test, so we have to approximate a positive diagnosis. We required that a person had two diagnosis codes occurring on two different dates in pregnancy and that they didn't occur on the same date as a screening code. This is a fairly stretched definition that we're hoping eliminated many false positive cases. And then finally, for syphilis treatment, we identify these based on procedure codes for the administration of the antibiotic or for with national drug codes for a dispensing of antibiotic. And as I mentioned at the top, recommended treatment in this case is benze benzathine, penicillin G, but we also recommend or identified some non-recommended alternative treatments, which is this list of antibiotics that's used sometimes for syphilis outside of pregnancy, but not recommended in pregnancy. Okay, so how did we uh, specifically define syphilis treatment? So as you'll remember in the beginning of this presentation, I noted that adequate treatment is quite specific. It's receipt of this specific antibiotic at least 30 days prior to delivery with dosage and timing aligned with syphilis stage. So in these data, we are able to capture these first two points. So we can capture if they get penicillin, penicillin G, and we can also capture the timing of that, but we don't have good enough data on syphilis stage to capture the third point of adequacy. So we focused on those first two. So here we looked at uh, benzathine, penicillin G happening at any time in pregnancy, we also looked at it happening at least 30 days prior to delivery, which would be adequate compared to those receiving it later, which would be inadequate. And then we looked at alternative antibiotics only among those that didn't receive the benzathine penicillin G. And specifically for those these alternative antibiotics, they were only included as a potential syphilis treatment if they had the medication administration within 30 days of the first syphilis diagnosis code. And the idea here was to try to limit the number of people who are getting these antibiotics for other indications. Finally, we identified state mandates for screening in pregnancy. First, whether the state mandated screening in pregnancy at all, which is in the white, and then in the gray uh, rows here, whether they required repeat screening in the third trimester. So some states implemented new mandates during our study period for third trimester screening. So we also made a separate category for these states. Okay, now we can get into some results. So in total, we had about 2.7 million live birth pregnancies in Medicaid and 3.5 million live birth pregnancies in our commercial data partners. These are pregnancies that are enrolled for the entirety of their pregnancy duration. 
The Medicaid pregnancies were younger, uh, less likely to be white and more likely to be Hispanic than the commercially insured pregnancies. Although I'll note that we did have a large amount of missing data, about 70% on race and ethnicity in our commercial populations. So this first bit of data on screening, um, we looked at the gestational timing of first syphilis screening in pregnancies, and we see some pretty large disparities by insurance type. So overall, we see that only 75% of pregnancies in Medicaid had screening at all in pregnancy or at delivery compared to 93% in the commercial plans. The Medicaid insured pregnancies were also less likely to have screening in the first trimester, 52% versus 82%. And again, these are pregnancies that are enrolled prior to pregnancy. So this isn't due to a lack of insurance coverage. We also looked at screening trends over time, given the known increase in congenital syphilis cases over this period. So the first two lines, the darker blue and the, the medium blue, um, we see some small increases in screening in among the Medicaid shares since 2016 in any screening in pregnancy and screening in the first trimester, but we really don't see much change um, in the commercial population here. However, in both populations, in this light blue line on the bottom, we see big great increases in the proportion of pregnancies that have repeat screening, which we defined as having screening in at least two of the trimesters. So this increases from about 20% to 40% in Medicaid and about 20% to 53% in the commercial plans. So now if we look at the populations enrolling sometime during pregnancy, we see some impacts on screening. So first, this is the day that you've already seen. So this is the population that's enrolled prior to pregnancy. Um, and we see 75% with any screening in the Medicaid commercial population and 93% in the commercial population. Next, we'll look specifically at those who are enrolled in first trimester. So we see a drop in the proportion with any screening to 63% in Medicaid and 79% in commercial. And then if we add in the population that was enrolled during the second trimester, we see a really substantial drop in the proportion that has evidence of screening during pregnancy. And uh, one thing we can see in this data also is uh, we see the proportion that's getting screened later in pregnancy for the first time, especially in that third trimester, which is the brighter blue bar. Um, we see that's increasing as enrollment becomes later. We can't be sure that these people did not have screening prior to their enrollment because we wouldn't observe that in our data. But this analysis is suggesting that some of these pregnancies that are enrolling later are catching up on screening as they are actually getting care in their pregnancy. Here we have some data on the proportion of first trimester screening by some covariates. Um, we see this first line here is our overall screening rate in both populations. And um, some trends that we see, early screening is less common in younger in individuals. Uh, we do also see some variation by race and ethnicity. And one covariate on the bottom here that I want to highlight um, is pregnancy-related care. So we do see a slight increase in the proportion with first trimester screening among those with pregnancy-related care in the first trimester but still far less than universal, 61% in Medicaid and 86% in commercial. So now this data is categorizing states by those screening mandates that we described in the methods section. So these first row um, shows screening at any time in pregnancy. And we see a bit of a surprising um, increase or greater amount of screening happening in states that did not have any screening mandates in the Medicaid population, um, although we see no difference in screening by states in the commercial population. For repeat screening, we see that the biggest increase is happening in states that have new policies that are requiring uh, this repeat screening in the third trimester. So that's the dark blue line in both figures for commercial and Medicaid. But overall, we do see increases in repeat screening, regardless of the category of mandates, um, which is promising. Switching over to our treatment data, we find that 43% of Medicaid insured and 50% of our commercially insured pregnancies among those that had a syphilis diagnosis did not have evidence of treatment. 
and we see about five to six percent had evidence of the non recommended treatment. We'll get into a little bit more about the limitations of and why we might see this. Um, these results in a second. And then finally, our last data point, we looked at screening and treatment in infants and found that largely our data source is probably not capturing this data. So this is screening and treatment in the first 30 days of life among infants who are born to individuals meeting our syphilis definition in pregnancy. So overall, we see about 5% of the Medicaid insured and 14% of the commercially insured infants had evidence of screening, and we see very small numbers uh, for evidence of treatment. So we believe this reflects the limitation of our data to identify this type of medical care in infants close to delivery due to practices in insurance reimbursement. So let's discuss some of the strengths and limitations and conclusions of our analysis. So overall, we see that syphilis screening in pregnancy across the US is failing to meet recommendations of universal screening. And we see a notable disparity by insurance type. So again, 75% of the Medicaid insured has um, any evidence of screening in pregnancy compared to about 93% of commercially insured. And we see that only about half of Medicaid insured actually were screened in the first trimester, which is recommended for early screening, um, even despite being enrolled in Medicaid for the entirety of the first trimester. Having that pregnancy related care in the first trimester only increased the screening proportion slightly to 61%. In contrast, 82% of our commercial injured pregnancies are being screened in the first trimester. So, despite the known ongoing increase in congenital syphilis cases, screening overall has really not increased that much over time, but we do see a really promising increase in repeat screening um, in this data. So as I noted, um, we had a difficult time assessing adequacy of syphilis treatment in pregnancy. So we only see about half of our syphilis diagnosed pregnancies um, with Evelyn, evidence of the recommended antibiotic, which is, which is benze benzathine penicillin G. And we see a relatively high proportion of cases that were treated with non-recommended antibiotics. So our claims-based sources may not be capturing all the administrations of this recommended treatment, um, because it's very expensive and it may be administered through public health departments, which wouldn't be reimbursed through an insurance system. So therefore we wouldn't capture it in our data. Uh, we also don't have in our data the indication for the medication. So the reason that their patient is getting a specific antibiotic. So we can't be sure that all of the patients who received an, an alternative antibiotic actually did receive it for syphilis. So because of this, we think our estimate of the alternative antibiotic use may be an upper bound for treatment in pregnancy. So some other strengths and limitations. Our data sources were very large and covered a good proportion of the US population. Um, and we were able to directly contrast the Medicaid and commercially insured populations to see these disparities. Um, we also have some other limitations of claims data that I'll address. So as I noted, uh, we have no laboratory data for the results of the syphilis screening. So we have to estimate that using our diagnosis codes. We also don't have great information on syphilis stage. Um, so we're, we couldn't assess the accuracy of treatment from that perspective. And we're also missing some care that's billed, not billed to insurance. For example, that public health department treatment and some of our conclusions on differences by race and ethnicity are limited by missing information on these variables, especially in our commercially injured population. But I'd like to thank you for your interest in our work on this topic on um, prenatal and congenital syphilis screening and treatment in pregnancy. And if you'd like to learn more about making Medicaid data more accessible through common data models and FHIR APIs project, follow the links shown in the description field below. Thank you.